pere, 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 Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Crap Cafe. Today, we'll be dissecting Zoro, one of our favorite Straw Hats and earliest characters in the story, who I believe has a backstory that Oda has been subtly sharing in the background, a history only revealed to those capable of solving a few of the longest-running mysteries in the series. Well, folks, in this theory, we'll be dissecting the Shimotsuki bloodline, piece by piece, and assembling this massive puzzle that Oda has been laying out for us all the way back from the beginning of the East Blue Saga, to Wano, and even now in Egghead. So, for this video, you can call me Trenton Judo, and buckle up and get ready for me to finally reveal Koina's fate, her connection to Tashigi, and lastly, uncover a whole new element of Zoro's backstory that will redefine his actions in the story, and potentially completely change your opinion of this end-of-series matchup. But before we get into any conspiracy theories, I want to start by giving a huge thank you to everyone who's decided to subscribe to the channel, like the videos, or decided to leave a comment. I'm so grateful for all the support the channel has gotten since launch, and I promise I'll work my hardest to keep cooking up the best One Piece theories on my half of the Grand Line. But I do have to warn you, sometimes they do come out a little spicy. And to all those who are still deciding whether or not to join the crew, I know we may seem like an intimidating lot, but don't worry, we're a jolly bunch. And better yet, we'll take anyone that we can get. Next, me have one arm and a bum leg. It's the crow's nest for you. So a big thank you to everyone once again, and if you're interested in seeing videos like this a few days early, as well as some other fun perks, please check out my membership page and help to support the channel. And I do my best to read each and every comment, so don't be afraid to say hello down below. <laughs> So let's begin this theory by breaking down our first piece of the puzzle and dispelling some of the confusion around it. Zoro's backstory has often been noted for its many differences between the anime and manga. In the manga, Zoro's backstory with Kuina is covered much earlier on, in the fifth chapter of the series, during his and Luffy's battle against Axehan Morgan, and as a result, it takes up less than half of the chapter it's in, and it tells a rather expedited story of Zoro and Kuina's rivalry at Shimotsuki Dojo leading to her eventual untimely demise and, seemingly, the beginning of Zoro's conviction to become the greatest swordsman in the world. Now, where most people become confused is the fact that in the anime, things take a slightly different route. The backstory appears somewhat randomly just before the Barati arc begins, in which Zoro is relaxing on board the Mary and begins to reminisce about his past. This version of events also begins from a slightly earlier point in Zoro's timeline, just before his arrival at Shimotsuki Dojo in which he storms into the dojo, claiming to be a practiced swordsman, and winds up dueling Kawina to either win control of the dojo or become one of their recruits. And as we all know, he loses the fight, and thus his grudge against Kawina begins. So before we can make much headway into this deep dive, we need to determine whether or not we should even bother with the anime's version of events. But when you take a moment to consider that from a narrative perspective at least, the manga version of events acts as a brief slideshow of the major beats of Zoro's time with Kuina, limiting how long Oda could focus on the topic, which is why Zoro canonically has the shortest backstory among all of the crew, at only seven pages long. So if Oda was limited in time, he may have decided to forego part of the story and was then eventually able to provide some guidance to the anime team much later on down the road, when his plans for Zoro were more concrete. Additionally, in this case at least, there's nothing that the anime version of events contradicts in the manga. In both versions, Zoro seems to appear as an orphan with no mention of his parents. And while he claims to be a traveling swordsman in the anime, it's clear that this is his first time using a sword, and he even admits to it later on. So with our timeline beginning to take form, what exactly can we take away from this additional piece of backstory? Well, the very first thing that should stick out to most of the adults in the room, and one that slipped by most people when they first saw the series, is where in the world are this kid's parents? And while Oda does give a very rough answer to this question much later on down the road, when you combine that question with this next one, it begins to form a story. So I want to take a moment to ask you, dear viewer, where does Zoro's dream of becoming the world's greatest swordsman begin? If you said after his fight with Kuina, that would certainly be the conventional answer. But upon further inspection, while both Zoro and Kuina both swear that night that one of them will become the world's greatest swords person, it's important to note that in this moment, Zoro is intending to encourage Kuina, who believes that because of her gender, she will never be as strong as him once they get older. 
Perhaps this was Zoro simply sharing his own personal dream with Kuina. After all, if they both share the same goal, then by the very definition, one of them will become the world's greatest swords person. In fact, I believe that Zoro was already in pursuit of this goal from the time he first laid eyes on the Shimotsuki Dojo. After all, according to the anime team, Zoro seemingly sought the dojo out and then challenged it with almost no experience. And if he lost, which was guaranteed to happen, he'd have to join the dojo, which I believe was his goal the entire time. It's also obvious just from the sheer amount of effort he puts in compared to his peers that his ambitions are much larger than theirs. And while it's stated that Zoro has no experience with swords, there is one last thing to mention. There is a brief moment during his initial fight with Kuina where Zoro loses one of the three swords and switches to a two-sword style stance. In this moment, Kuina, who is a remarkably skilled combatant for this point in her life, stops and asks if Zoro actually has proper combat experience in that style. But according to Zoro's own admission of never holding a sword before, how can Zoro both have no experience and briefly intimidate a skilled fighter? Was this his Shimotsuki blood activating his inner talents or perhaps had he had the chance to observe someone using this form sometime before and in that moment he was simply doing his best imitation well for now let's just remember these questions and maybe we'll find some answers as we examine the remaining pieces of this puzzle <laughs> Now, the second aspect of Zoro's backstory, while it adds a significant amount of context to Zoro's origins, was only given to us just recently at the tail end of Wano. Not to mention, Oda didn't even reveal this contextual information in the manga. It was addressed in an SBS. So, from the chart we are given, Oda reveals a very vague but interesting series of events that leads to the foundation of Shimotsuki Village and the birth of both Zoro and Kuina. According to Oda, 55 years ago, 25 residents of the Wano Kingdom departed from the island. This group eventually landed on the island that would become the current day Shimotsuki village, and after ridding the island of its bandit problem, a portion of the group decided to settle down there, and after mingling with the locals, Shimotsuki Furuko, who is the older sister of Ushimaru, the former daimyo of Ringo, decided to settle down with a man in the village by the name of Roronoro Penzoro. And soon, Roronoro Arashi, Zoro's father, was born. He would grow up on the island, and later in his life, he would enter a romance with a woman by the name of Tara, and the two fell in love, and sometime after, our beloved swordsman, Roronoro Zoro, was born. On the other side of the family tree that Oda provided, we see that Kozoburo also settled down with a woman from the village, and she gave birth to their son, Shimotsuki Koshiro, who we should all recognize from Zoro's flashback as Kuina's father. So the first thing we should note from this series of reveals is that Zoro and Kawina are actually distant cousins. This also explains why Zoro, who lacks the Shimotsuki surname, looked so much like Ryuma when we encountered his zombie on Thriller Bark. Despite his last name, Zoro is as much of a Shimotsuki as Kawina. Which actually brings us to our next takeaway, which is that all the Zoro and Kawina and Zoro and Toshigi shippers are now going to jail. Lock them up. Additionally, the Zoro and Harori Sarks have never been higher. The next key takeaway is that we actually received some answers to a few of the lingering questions we had from the previous section. However, for as many answers as we got, we also have a few more questions, but I hope to get to the bottom of some of those soon. First of all, we know what happened to Zoro's parents and why they aren't in the picture when he arrives at the Shimotsuki Dojo. Of course, we don't know the exact order of events, but we now know that Zoro's mother Terra died of an illness and Adashi, Zoro's father, died in a battle against pirates. This is what left Zoro orphaned at the start of his backstory. But what we still don't know is where did Zoro get his dream to be the world's greatest swordsman? And where did Zoro first see the two sword style before? Not to mention, now that we've found out exactly how Zoro's parents died, who exactly were the pirates that killed Zoro's father? Well, believe it or not, I think by using some deductive reasoning, we might just be able to answer each of these questions. The first question I'll attempt to answer is one that I consider to be the easiest, which is, where did Zoro see the two-sword style before? Well, when you consider that Zoro comes from a long line of swordsmen, it's very likely that his father, Adashi, also practiced the blade. Not to mention, Ushimaru is Adashi's uncle, and if he was raised by his mother on stories of his uncle's accomplishments, he too may have been drawn towards the two-sword style. And depending on the timeline of events, it's possible that Adashi could have been around to train in front of a toddler Zoro. 
Unfortunately, however, by that same logic, it is equally possible that Arashi's battle against the pirates may have happened before Zoro's very eyes, and a young Zoro could have even witnessed the murder of his father, imprinting his father's final two-sword style form into his brain subconsciously, and possibly planting the idea in his head that he has to become the world's strongest swordsman. So, one question down, now let's pick something a little harder, like who exactly were the pirates that killed Zoro's dad? And for this question, I have a pretty unbelievable answer. In fact, once I start listing off the details of what we know about Arashi's killer, the more it feels like a game of 21 questions. So, I'll start listing things off, and let's see how soon you can guess our number one suspect. A pirate some 15 to 20 years ago, familiar with the East Blue, most likely a big name as he was strong enough to defeat a Wano samurai and descendant of Ushimaru and Ryuma who just so happened to be in the East Blue. They were most likely also a swordsman as Arashi was a swordsman and Oda typically pairs the same skill types against each other. And our last clue is that after the smoke had settled, a young Zoro was likely left with the goal of becoming the world's strongest swordsman. Yes, that's right, what if instead of Arashi dying in a fight against pirates, he was killed in a fight against a pirate? Specifically, one who was active at the time, familiar with the East Blue, and goes by the title of World's Strongest. I believe that Zoro's father Arashi was killed not in a battle against any old riffraff, but in a battle against none other than Dracul Mihawk himself. To support this wild theory, let me present a bit more evidence. If we estimate that Zoro's father was killed a handful of years before he came to the Shimotsuki Dojo, then we are looking for a period roughly 15 to 20 years before the present day in the story, which not only lines up with Mihawk's age range, but Mihawk must have got his title the world's strongest swordsman from somewhere. So we can assume that he must have defeated countless opponents on his path to the world's strongest. If Zoro's father was even half as talented as he is, he would have easily been the strongest swordsman in all of the East Blue, and made a great challenge for a young Mihawk. So not only does this line up with his ambition, but there's always been a moment in Mihawk's duel against Zoro that has always stood out to me. You see, just before they go in for their final clash, Mihawk's expression changes. For a moment, something about Zoro shocks Mihawk before he eventually continues on with his attack. Many people have pointed to this moment as Mihawk possibly sensing Zoro's latent hockey, or even dismissed it as Mihawk briefly acknowledging Zoro's skills. But what if there is another possibility? What if in the moment that Mihawk was going into attack, he realized that he'd fought a very similar looking man once before? You see, Zoro's family tree has a rather odd characteristic, in which some of the male members bear a rather striking resemblance to their ancestor Ryuma. What if Alashi also bore a resemblance to Ryuma, and thus Zoro as well? And upon seeing this connection, he decides to avoid snuffing out another talented young swordsman. After all, Mihawk sits alone at his position at the top, unable to enjoy the thrill of battle like he did in his youth, like a sexy version of Saitama. This guilt is likely what caused him to spare Zoro and refuse the offer to take his life. Instead, Mihawk encourages him to train hard and seek him out to become the next strongest swordsman in the world, much like how I believe Zoro chose to encourage Kuina. This also recontextualizes everything about Zoro sacrificing his pride to be trained under Mihawk during the time skip. This isn't simply Zoro throwing aside his pride to be trained by the man he wants to surpass, it's Zoro going to the man who killed his father and almost killed him and begging him to train him so that he can be strong enough to make his captain the king of the pirates and make good on his promise to Kawina. This would be the epitome of sacrifice. It could also explain why Mihawk even accepted the task of training Zoro in the first place, especially when he knows that Zoro one day plans to use all of those skills to potentially kill him in battle. But if Mihawk feels responsible for setting Zoro on this path, taking him under his wing is the least he could do. And if this connection was really something Oda was planning from the beginning, it may be why Zoro's backstory in the anime is shifted to be just before his fight with Mihawk, in order to subtly tie those aspects of the story together. So, with this earth-shaking reveal, we've answered all of the questions I had initially posed regarding Zoro's backstory. We now know who killed Zoro's father, and we may have even found a potential answer for why his lifelong goal began before he even arrived at the dojo. But there is still one lingering element of this puzzle that Oda has left for us, or 
Should I say two, because we still need to figure out the true purpose of Koina and Tashigi, and why they are so inextricably tied to Zoro's narrative. The mystery of Koina and Tashigi is surprisingly one of the oldest questions in all of One Piece, and it's also taken many forms over the years as the wider story has developed. Tashigi went from possibly being a long-lost twin to Kawina in disguise, and now, even more recently, there are thoughts that she could be a possible clone. So, with all of this speculation concealing the truth, I'm honored to be the one to crack this case wide open. And fortunately, as I'm exploring this question some 25 years after it was presented, there's been a lot of secondary evidence that Oda has released regarding the topic. In fact, Oda has actually given us a tremendous amount of info about these two, tucked away within the Viver cards. If you're unfamiliar, the Viver cards are a collectible card set released in Japan with unreleased info about some of the characters they feature. In the case of Kuina and Tashi, we've been given info including birthdays, ages, photos from their early childhoods, hell, even their blood types. And I think we can use this info to decipher this puzzle. And there's a few things we can piece together almost right away. The first thing we can confirm is that Kawina and Tashigi are 100% not the same person, and Kawina is, unfortunately, deceased. First, Oda has given each of them their own personal birthdays, Kawina on September the 17th and Tashigi on October the 8th. They're also of different ages. Tashigi is the same age as Zoro, and Kawina is a year older than Zoro, meaning the two are also born a year apart. Kawina being deceased, on the other hand, is something Oda has basically confirmed directly. He's said as much on her Viver card, and while her body is hidden in the anime due to censorship, in the manga, we do see her corpse. And unless she's really good at acting and being buried alive, it's safe to assume she's no longer with us. Although, as a small bit of closure, I do believe Oda used Tashigi as a vessel to demonstrate exactly what happened to Kawina when she was mysteriously killed in her fall down the stairs. Oda gives us a scene in the anime in which she trips down the stairs of the ship while carrying her sword, and it slips out of her hand and almost impales her. I believe this is exactly what happened to Kawina, only that she wasn't so lucky. Now, moving on to a less depressing topic, we can also cross off the clone option, as even though Kawina and Tashiki both share the same appearance and even the same S blood type, Oda has gone out of his way to distinguish the two with one key characteristic. Tashigi's vision and need of glasses. Tashigi is one of the few characters in the story that actually relies on glasses to see. It's basically just her and Kawina's father, and maybe one other. But if you don't trust her and really think she's faking it, then pop into One Piece Pirate Warriors 3, and when you taunt while using Tashigi, you'll get to see the world through her shitty eyes for a moment, proving that she is not only not Kawina, but is also not genetically identical to her either, meaning that we can almost be certain that Tashigi is not a clone of Kawina. Okay, so she's not the same person, and she's not a clone, so does this mean that she's just related to Kawina? Maybe a, a younger sister? Well, actually, I do believe that the two are related, but like Zoro and Kawina, I think the connection is closer to distant cousins. As far as lineage, we know next to nothing about Tashigi, but with the info we do know, and armed with the fact that she was born in the East Blue, I think we can go back to Zoro's family tree to get some answers to this lingering mystery. So, let's go over the beginning of Zoro's family tree one more time. According to Oda, 55 years ago, 25 citizens of Wano departed the island. Then, they arrived on the island that would one day become Shimotsuki Village, with 10 of them eventually deciding to settle down there. However, we never really asked what happened to the other 15 members who continued sailing the East Blue in search of a home. It's very likely that they too would have developed a settlement somewhere else in the East Blue. In fact, this location would likely share the same Japanese aesthetic as Wano in Shimotsuki Village. And wouldn't you know it, I think Oda left us this answer in the backstory of another member of the Straw Hats. You see, Nami's backstory focuses on her time in Kokayashi Village. However, Nami wasn't actually born in the Konami Islands. She was actually found and saved by Belmare on a completely different island. That island was the Oikot Kingdom, or, when read backwards, the Tokyo Kingdom. 
It's always been strange that such a random island in Nami's backstory was given the title of Japan's capital city. It almost immediately implies that there's some sort of mystery afoot. What if Nami wasn't the only character from this island? And maybe Toshigi was also born on the island as a descendant of the original 15 settlers from Wano, making her Shimotsuki Toshigi. But even with a birthplace and family relationship finally established, we still don't know the exact reason for Toshigi and Kawina sharing such an uncanny appearance. But in all fairness, while we've been examining the Shimotsuki bloodline thus far, it's been made abundantly clear that their family genes are pretty damn strong. So I want to pose a question to you. If Zoro had a separate third male cousin, what would they look like? Would they have a completely unique appearance because Zoro somehow inherited all the Ryuma juice for his generation? Or would they too bear a resemblance to Ryuma? With this in mind, I'd like to pose a new question. What if Kuina and Toshigi aren't doppelgangers of one another? Maybe they both share the resemblance of another distant ancestor. But who could this mysterious character be? In addition, it would also reframe the subtext of Zoro and Kawina's rivalry. This could possibly be Oda retelling a series of events that happened centuries ago, that's been repeating itself ever since, foreshadowing a great rivalry from long ago. So this character must be from around the same time as Ryuma, just before the Void Century began. But who is this person, and why did Oda need to hide their existence so deep in this theory iceberg? Well, I actually have a breathtaking answer for this. And it starts with the question, what if the ancestor that Kawina and Toshigi resemble isn't a woman at all, but a man? After all, genetics have little to do with gender. What if within this most recent generation, a male version of Kawina's ancestor was never born? And while we have no idea what Toshigi's mother and father looked like, as well as Kawina's mother, we do spend a fair amount of time with her father, who was actually remarkably fixated on and seemingly disappointed by Kawina's gender. What if, as a male of this side of the family, he represents our best example of what this ancestor would have looked like? And I think there's an additional clue we can incorporate as well. Looking at Kawina and Toshiki, there's only one detail that separates the two. And coincidentally, it happens to be the one similarity between Koshiro and the two girls. Glasses. And more importantly, their poor eyesight. What if this branch of the Shimotsuki are like the Uchiha? Except instead of the Sharingan, they pass down shitty eyesight. So, with this final clue in mind, I think we can finally zero in on our answer. It would appear that we are looking for a glasses-wearing swordsman, similar in appearance to Koshiro, who was around during the time of Ryuma, just before the Void Century began. Yes, that's right, I believe that Oda has been secretly planning to reveal that Saint Ethan Baron V. Nisjuro is truly a distant member of the Shimotsuki family and an ancestor of Zoro. <laughs> Outside of all of the recent info we've learned on Egghead, we know next to nothing about the origins of the Five Elders. This is mostly due to their age and the fact that they have likely outlived most historians. But just from their appearance alone, we can make a few assumptions. First, it's safe to say that they aren't simply creations made by Emo, as some have speculated, as Oda went out of his way from the moment they were introduced to design them with battle scars and even birthmarks. It's unlikely that Emu made these perfect beings in such an imperfect form, and from what we've seen from some of the recent chapters of Egghead, it doesn't even seem possible to inflict wounds on the Gorosei. So this would imply that there was a time before and after they were made immortal. There's a lot more we can deduce in regards to the Gorosei, but for now, the only thing that matters is the fact that this means that each of the Gorosei were born and raised somewhere in the One Piece world. And while I plan to make a theory video finding all of the birthplaces of the Gorosei sometime in the future, for this video, we'll just be focusing on the one, Saint Venus, the warrior god of finance, who I believe hails from the kingdom of Wano for two main reasons. First is, as we just discovered, he is clearly connected to the Shimotsuki family, and he even seems to be the OG version of Koshiro. And if Oda was indeed using Kawina and Zoro as replacements for Ryuma and Venus, it would mean that he had to hail from the kingdom in order to have a rivalry with Ryuma. 
But if that's true and he and Ryuma were rival cousins or siblings, then why doesn't he have the Shimotsuki name? Well, I think a better question would be, what are the odds that Emu found five powerful allies that all had planetary-themed names? At least one or two of these guys clearly decided to make a fake name in order to sever all ties to their homelands. And I think Ethan Baron Venus Judo is the fakest name of the bunch. You may already be familiar with Judo, as many characters concealing their identity in Wano chose to add it to the end of their names, but what you may not know is the meaning of Judo in Japan. When translated, it roughly means 10th son, which would imply you were from a large family, and thus of a higher status than basic commoners. So several characters chose to add this fancy suffix to their names as part of their disguise. So we can assume Nosjudo is a fake name, as Oda has already primed us for this earlier in Wano. But what about Ethan Baron? Well, like Judo, a Baron is also a fancy title that members of the lowest level of British nobility were allowed to use. That means that both of his names have the same fake naming scheme, so it's safe to say that Ethan Baron Venus Judo is basically just his rap name, so his group has a cool aesthetic. And as to what his actual name is, who knows? It's possible it could just be Shimotsuki Ethan, and Baron Venus Judo was added to disguise his identity, but Ethan doesn't really scream Wano to me, so feel free to leave some of your guesses in the comments below. Now, my second main reasoning is something that I have yet to bring up and not only links him to Zoro even more, but also links St. Ethan inextricably with Wano. And that connection is hiding within Zoro's swords. Or, more specifically I suppose, the connection between Zoro's family and his swords. You see, Zoro's main sword, the Wada Wichimanji, is actually not his sword to begin with. In actuality, it belonged to Kuina, and after her death, Koshiro gifted the sword to Zoro. He gets another sword when he meets their other cousin Toshigi, and she helps him pick out some new swords swords from Ippon Matsu's sword shop in Logtown. In fact, part of Toshigi's character is that she is a sword aficionado, and wants to keep name blades out of the hands of people that she deems cruel or unworthy. Despite this, she picks out a pretty great sword for Zoro, the Sandai Kitetsu. Zoro gets another great sword when he bumps into Ryuma on Thriller Bark, and he gives him his blade named Shusui as a reward for defeating him. And the latest addition to Zoro's arsenal is Enma, which he traded Shusui for when he returned to his homeland in Wano. But what's more impressive than Zoro getting a sword whenever he reconnects with his distant family is the fact that each of the swords has been forged by people he has a connection to. Believe it or not, but Enma and the Wado Ichimanji were both made by Shimotsuki Kozaburo, Kuina's grandfather, and the Sandai Kitetsu was made by Kozuki Sukiyaki, Momo's grandfather, and the former Shogun of Wano. Additionally, from the moment Tashigi introduced us to the Sandai, she also revealed that the Sandai is the third and lowest grade model of the Kitetsu line, preceded by the Nidai Kitetsu and the Shodai Kitetsu. The Nidai is made by Kozuki Kotetsu, Sukiyaki's ancestor. Currently, this sword is in possession of Sukiyaki, who keeps it displayed on his mantle. Many of us were really hoping that Zoro would get to use this weapon and may even swap it out for the Sandai, but for some reason, Oda made a point to keep it out of Zoro's hands. I think this may have something to do with the previous owner of the blade. It's never made mention to in Wano, but simply the fact that Sukiyaki is displaying this named sword on his mantle must mean that this is a weapon he holds dear. And in Wano specifically, swords represent the person who wielded them in life, even going so far as to act as their headstones when they die. So what person in Sukiyaki's past used this blade when they were alive? Well, I think the only logical answer to this question is Ushimaru. This would not only explain why it's on his mantle, as the death of the former daimyos was truly Sukiyaki's final failure as the former shogun of Wano, but as we've seen from Ushimaru's fighting style, he is a two-sword style user, very fitting of the Nidai, much like his three-sword style using grandnephew who wields the Sandai. Of course, we've never seen Ushimaru wield this blade, but to be fair, the only time we spent with him was after he had been imprisoned, and at that point all of his true weapons were confiscated. So with the Nidai located and its user identified, there is only one more of these famed blades remaining in the world. 
The Shodai Kitetsu is one of the 12 supreme grade blades and strongest of the Kitetsu line. However, despite it being the highest ranking of the three, it's the one that we know the least about. It's almost like its existence has been erased from history. Unlike the Sandai and the Nidai, we have no idea who created this legendary blade, nor do we know its location or even who wields it. But what we can do is examine the Sandai and the Nidai to at least get an idea of what the weapon may look like. Our main similarities between our only confirmed Kitetsu are located on the hilt, where both the Sandai and the Nidai have a gold buckle on the very hilt, followed by a gold band in the middle and the guard, which has a very unique pattern. And finally, their most distinguishing characteristic is the flame-like pattern on the edge of the blade. So keeping this pattern in mind and going back to St. Ethan, you may notice that miraculously, the sword that St. Ethan uses matches that description perfectly. Now, this has been a long-held theory in the community, but I think just recently in Egghead, Oda has given us the final clue we needed. Now that we've seen Ethan's sword in action up close and personal, if you look closely, we can see the same flame-like pattern as the other two Kitetsu, proving that Saint Ethan is currently in possession of the Shodai Kitetsu, which not only is the last nail in the coffin to prove he comes from Wano, but also, given what we've seen of his strength now on Egghead, what does this revelation mean for the story? Well, I have one question for you. Who is truly the strongest swordsman in the world? From everything that we've discovered about Zoro in this video, and everything we've known about him from his adventures in the story, there has always been one goal that he has ceaselessly been striving to, to be the strongest swordsman in the world. And until very recently, I had always believed that the title of the strongest swordsman in the world was a heated competition between two men, Mihawk and Shanks. But now that we are being introduced to such a powerful and integral character so late in the series, how does this affect the rankings? To be honest, Mihawk was already on shaky ground when he just had a contest with the one-armed man, but what we thought separated the two was their swordsmanship skills, and that Mihawk was the more talented of the two, and Shanks was only able to cover for this gap with his powerful hockey. But with the introduction of Saint Ethan and the reveal of his skill set, I think Mihawk may finally have met his match. Saint Ethan has everything Mihawk has and more. He possesses a Saijo Owazumoto grade sword, one of the 12 supreme grade swords. He's had hundreds of years to refine his swordsmanship skills in the experience that comes with it, and his hockey may be on the same level as Red Hair himself. And this is all before we even mention his awakened devil fruit or apparent immortality. At this point, St. Ethan seems to have transcended the current strongest swordsman in the world and exists as the strongest swordsman in the heavens. In fact, there's a title given to certain other worldly swordsmen that exist in the One Piece world. The title of Sword God. And this is the actual title that Ryuma had when he was alive. And with this final clue, I think we can see the full picture of Ryuma and Ethan's history. By looking into the past, I think we can piece together why Zoro, as well as many people in his family, have seemingly shared the goal of being the world's strongest swordsman and establish a new finish line for Zoro's dream. Zoro and Kawina's rivalry comes to a head in their flashback when they duel under a full moon with real katanas for the first time in their lives. Thankfully, because they were children, Oda decided to have Kawina spare Zoro. But what if this wasn't a battle between children, but a battle between grown swordsmen? What if, before Ethan left Wano and joined Emu to become one of the Gorosei, he slayed Ryuma in combat, claiming the title of Sword God for himself, and ascending to Merijoa? While it has been mentioned that Ryuma died of an illness, it is important to mention that he was only 47 years old, which just seems a little young to me. So, popping Ryuma's corpse from Thriller Bark onto the examining table, there's a very interesting detail that sticks out. Peeking out from Ryuma's kimono are a set of two poorly done stitches running across the center of his chest, and notably, every other stitch on his body seems to be from the process of reanimating him. We can even double check this by looking at all the other zombies on the island, whose stitches are all expertly done by Hogback during the zombification process, and not the blocky ones that Ryuma has only on his chest. So maybe Ryuma's battle against Ethan only wounded him, and he died later from an infection from the injuries. Zoro, notably, has had several run-ins with nasty untreated wounds, and thus far he's been okay, but maybe that day Ryuma's luck ran out. Either way, if Ethan was the one to actually inflict this wound, this means that he is the one responsible for Ryuma's death. 
even if it was the infection from the wounds that killed him. And if he did defeat Ryuma and take the title for himself before erasing his presence from the world, it would explain why a new sword god was never named. So if Ethan killed Ryuma and claimed the title, then maybe the reason Ryuma's descendants strive for the same goal is because they were inheriting his will and ambition, and it is driving them to reclaim their title once again, in honor of their ancient ancestor. So now that we understand a bit more about the past, we can use that info to look forwards in the story. Clearly, this is something Oda has been waiting to reveal for a very long time, and given that we're in the final stretch of the series, whatever this revelation is must impact the end game of the story. And from all my research, I've come to one conclusion. That Oda has been setting Zoro on a collision course for Ethan since his introduction to the series, or, more specifically, ever since Tashigi was introduced to the story, as she not only caused us to begin questioning her family tree, and by extension Zoro's, but she also introduced us to the concept of the Kitetsu Blades, and her goal is to reclaim weapons that are in the hands of people that they shouldn't belong to. When you tie all of these seemingly random threads together, there's only one conclusion. I think it's clear at this point that if Zoro truly wants to become the strongest, he'll need to defeat St. Ethan, and not just Mihawk as we once thought. Through a fairly unclimactic battle against a former mentor and practically friend at this point, but instead, Zoro's final battle will be against St. Venus, and Zoro will have a chance to inherit his ancestor Ryuma's namesake and become the next God of the Sword. Now, of course, like many of my theories, this is something that we have to wait for Oda to address directly. But with the end of the series drawing ever closer and Egghead heating up like never before, it really feels like this theory could be confirmed in the near future. Of course, there's no hate for Mihawk or Mihawk fans. I think a second battle between the two would really be incredible, but a battle between our young wolf and the sword god is the tension I've always been looking for in Zoro's end of series matchup. So please, let me know if you agree with this theory in the comments below. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. And if you've made it this far in the video, please leave a like if you enjoyed it. And if you liked learning about this hidden backstory, you might want to check out my videos on the secret backstories of Don Krieg and Captain Kuro. Or if you would prefer to ponder some of the Straw Hats final matchups a little longer, take a peek at my video on Usopp and how I believe he will need to develop in the series to defeat the mighty Van Auger. So please, subscribe if you would like to see more of me in the future. That's all for now. Thank you for coming by the Crab Cafe.